Excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, so yeah, so today I'm going to talk very briefly uh, and very acceleratedly about kind of a, a cross section of our work around data. Uh, and specifically, so the GDALT project is this immense uh, sort of archive of human society. And today I'm going to talk about just a tiny slice of that, which is our collaboration with the Internet Archive TV News Archive, which today spans over 5 million broadcasts uh, from over 108 uh, channels spanning 50 countries and territories in 35 languages and dialects from over 20 years on five continents. Uh, and so, you know, really, my so essentially, if you kind of look back at it, you know, my, my, uh, I started collaborating with the TV News Archive about a decade ago. We started off with mapping the geography of television news. Uh, and specifically, you know, this was a huge bespoke uh, project requiring immense amounts of computing time. And essentially what we did is we took the closed captioning transcripts of those television channels and extracted out the geography. So we could map out and say, uh, you know, what channels cover what essentially. Uh, and then move forward a little bit. We started using audio fingerprinting. So we could take a, a State of the Union address and then actually scan global television for the fingerprint. So for example, if Obama's speaking about Iran and Iranian state television excerpts that, they're gonna overdub it into, but it's gonna be about 95% of the audio will be Persian, but there'll be just that tiny amount of the original that's always kind of there to convey uh, sort of atmospherics, but that's enough for it to latch onto. So you can actually say what part of the State of the Union, what lines of the State of the Union address kind of went viral in what places. And also looking at things like ad data and others, how can we visualize that? And then moving forward a little bit came engram. So again, traditional word frequency histograms. So we start looking at interesting things. So this is actually mentions of COVID here um, across BBC, uh, BBC News Television out of London, so domestic, uh, and their world service and domestic radio. And so we can see kind of this rise, but then we can see of interest uh, domestic radio kind of pivoting away from it, whereas everybody else kind of goes globally. Uh, and then fast forward a little bit, uh, and we move to full text. So you can imagine we kind of start off with bespoke computational analyses and then moving forward just a little bit, uh, eventually then to engrams uh, and then to full text search. So this is the idea that you could keyword search those closed captioning transcripts and treat television as data, essentially. And what was interesting about this is journalists is particularly, because that's their huge focus of ours are journalists and scholars, and they're used to keyword search. You know, uh, you know, for 50, I think it was almost 60 years now, dialogue came out. And so we sort of have 60 years of people being taught how to, how to think about things in terms of keywords. So the idea of keyword searching the transcripts of, of television was not that uh, foreign of a concept. You do things like look at COVID and we can see it kind of rise, falling away, coming back, kind of stratifying here, compare different channels, kind of look at those patterns there. Uh, we can then uh, look in different ways. So a traditional timeline, a stream graph, we can look at it hourly and kind of see different patterns there. Uh, fast forward a little bit. And we said, well, you know, another source of text on television is the OCR, the on-screen text. And so using video OCR, extracting that. Now, what's interesting is we think about American television news will be just English. Well, it turns out you have all kinds of other stuff. This was actually Taliban media. Uh, you have all kinds of, of material and some, and some things that could almost uh, pass as recapture basically text. Um, so you can keyword search that. But then we can go a step further because we have that, uh, that on-screen text. Well, in one case, what we did is we could say, well, when someone speaks, when they're interviewed on television news, the Chiron, the bottom uh, text actually says their name and their affiliation. So we can actually use a simple regular expression and actually make a chronology essentially of all the doctors that are speaking. So you can see sort of in the early days of COVID, it was whatever doctor picked up the phone at, you know, four o'clock in the morning to be on the 5 a.m. morning show. And then it kind of progressed uh, over time, eventually with immunologists and so on. Uh, we can also do things like, because we have that on-screen text, we want to look at CNN, remember, for a long time had this COVID dashboard. Well, how do you look for a dashboard? Well, look at the credit text in the bottom. And so then we can actually catalog that and see the moment when it sort of pivots away, right as Biden gets inaugurated, new year, new administration, and COVID just vanishes. Uh, and so the ability to kind of visualize that and see, you know, actually to the hour, essentially, when it pivots away. Um, but then we can do also interesting things. So one of the things, of course, that makes television so distinctive is not the text, it's the visual part of it. So we can catalog that. So we use Google's cloud video to annotate uh, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, BBC News London, and the evening news broadcast. And one of the things that we did is we said, well, what's different about television news in the COVID era? And so that was actually occurring. The first thing that came back was bookcases. It was kind of like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the meaning of life, 42. Uh, so what's different? Well, bookcases. It turns out, uh, bookcases were not that common on television news. And then suddenly, whoosh, they're everywhere. But only on BBC News and MSNBC. Fox News and CNN did not. Um, and if you look at it, what happens is on BBC News and MSNBC, basically everyone had to, all the studios were closed, everyone had to record from home. And 
all ran and found whatever bookcase that they had in their house, and that became their background. Um, so again, the ability to kind of see uh, the fact that, again, we think of bookcases in the West, in certain countries, we think of bookcases as shorthand for expertise. What's interesting is also across the world, there are very different uh, metaphors for expertise, whether that is maybe certain uh, like royal furnishings in some countries, whether that is uh, certain types of imagery, certain types of environments. Uh, and so that was very interesting, kind of see how that varied across the world and be able to see that. Um, and what's interesting is if you're interested in what it looks like to do at scale video analysis, um, all those videos that are run through um, Google's cloud video API, we actually make the full raw JSON annotations of those available. And so you can actually look through and understand, well, what does it look like to do this type of analysis? Um, but of course, an important task in television news is to separate advertisements from news content. And historically, this was done using all kinds of different algorithmic approaches, you know, looking for fade to black and different audio levels and such, but none of those work really well. They all have huge error. But it turns out there's actually a hidden signal in television news. Uh, so every captioning line, there's actually a signal that tells us, is this advertising or is this news? So we can immediately see uh, RE3. So, and then we can see, oh, well, this is cap, this is a caption, POP stands for essentially advertising. And so we can see, oh, well, here's an advertising up, oh, now we're back to the news. And so again, these hidden signals that oftentimes when we think about how we visualize and understand data, we think about, oh, well, we got to get these algorithms in place. But sometimes there's, there's the data we need is right there. We just didn't even know to look at it. Um, and I did want to mention now that AI is such a big deal, I'm going to return to this in a little bit. Um, there's all this push now for like speech recognition through tools like Whisper, for example, which is OpenAI's ASR tool. Something to keep in mind is, these, this new generation of tools uh, for things like chat GPT, you want a different answer. You want creativity there. You don't want creativity if you're trying to transcribe a video where there's a right answer or you need to translate it where you want, yeah, some word choices can change a little bit, but it needs to convey the same thing. Um, every time you run Whisper, up to 80% of the result changes each time you run it. So here's an example uh, where we run it and it's, yes, this is the answer to the NATO threat to Putin. So this was the NATO secretary general was saying that NATO does not pose a threat to Putin. And instead, uh, Whisper translates it as NATO is a threat to Putin. And then, of course, then it eventually translates it correctly. But here's a great example. We ran it three times in a video, and it translates this sentence, but it translates as Turkey will deliver grain to Europe, the gas to Europe, or delivery of weapons. Which of those is it? Uh, and what's interesting is the confidence, all the, the temperature, essentially confidence, all those, they're identical in these cases. There's nothing you can latch on to and say, oh, it's, it's a little bit unsure about this. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as you think about some of these newer AI tools that are out there. Um, and it can also do things like repetition, where it just gets into a bad state um, and completely destroys this transcript. And there's nothing to tell you what happened there. So I just like to kind of mention all the different ways that these things can go horribly wrong or can just uh, completely hallucinate. Uh, in one particular case, uh, so this one, you can see Samsung here. In one case, in the middle of the Bucha massacre, it starts hallucinating uh, an entire story about how Apple and Samsung came together and made a cell phone together. Uh, that bears absolutely no resemblance of any kind of the video, it's unclear what triggers these things. But just to keep in mind, as we think about the power of AI and you know everyone's kind of rushing forward, what amazed us was there were people that recognized that these were issues, but we didn't, but even those people are like, yeah, there's some issues, but we've got to rush forward. This is an amazing tool. It's so cool. We've got to use it. Um, there were precious, precious few voices that stopped and said, you know what? There's some real problems. This is not ready for prime time yet. So just kind of thinking about that. We actually, in our case, use Google Speech to Text, which is a traditional ASR. It's a, de it's a deterministic one. Um, and what's interesting is humans, so we have a baseline for television news in the United States. It's hand type. There are live human beings watching the television as you watch it, typing what they're hearing. And that's why there's a delay on captioning. But what's interesting is they type so fast and they get so overwhelmed, they'll miss things. Like if it says, this is so-and-so, the, the US ambassador to Estonia, they'll skip the US ambassador to Estonia. They just can't type fast enough. So that's one of the things is ASR is actually more complete. Um, and typically what this looks like is, you know, the JSON ends up looking like things like this. You get confidence, you get all kinds of different data there. Um, and where this becomes interesting then is um, we can then, once you have that, you can then translate that into English. And so fast forward to that, um, what, what I'll come to in a second, uh, in, a, in a few moments, I'll return to this, is in collaboration with the Internet Archive, with the start of the of the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, they began monitoring Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian television. Um, now, again, native speakers can watch those clips and understand that. But our one of our key areas was journalists and scholars um, across the world that do not speak Ukrainian or Russian or Belarusian. And um, so the question is, well, how do you make this content accessible? So what we do is we transcribe all those all those videos. So every broadcast, we transcribe it and then translate into English. And so you can see, uh, for example, here, you can actually see uh, um, an overlay in, in the original Russian. But here uh, in, our inner, in our default interface, 
what you see is an actual transcript. So there's actually um, along the side, which I'll come back to, there's a running transcript in English to translate it, machine translating English of what's said. But then as you watch a clip, you can see a, a kind of a, a miniature transcript right there. But as they speak, you're seeing a captioning overlay in English. So that allows you to really understand what's happening in these. And again, it's machine, it's machine done, but the idea is journalists and volunteers can spot something and say, wow, what is this? This is really important. And then uh, go to a native speaker who can then, because again, no, uh, no news outlet has enough Russian speakers to translate all of Russian television to be able to understand like, what are the narratives? How are they framing it? What are the falsehoods that are being used there? No one has those kind of resources. So ability for the machine to do the bulk work, a bulk of that work, and then the human beings to target and say, well, what are they saying here? Is that really what they're saying there? It turns out, yes. Um, and then there's also multimodal analysis. So one of the things I want to, to talk about, oftentimes we think about media in isolation. So one of the things that we did here, this was a collaboration with First Draft, is we scanned television news um, using our on-screen text OCR to extract out any Donald Trump tweet, connected that back to the, to the Trump archive, and then connected that back to um, when did Twitter flag? So Twitter began flagging his tweets. And one of the questions we wanted to know is, did that actually drive television news? And it turns out, yes, and he learned that. So what we found is Donald Trump actually learned that if the news cycle was not to his liking, he could tweet something. And um, one, and then something that would get no attention. So initially, no one cared about it. But then Twitter would label that as this is disputed. Now, immediately, that drove the television news cycle for the next 72 hours. And so everything else got, everything else got pushed aside. So he learned that. And we, you actually see that feedback there, that feedback loop. So again, the ability to leverage, to take one medium, television, use the OCR and that, connect that to another one, social media, to ask these types of questions and what we can do with that. Another one is actually contextualizing broadcasts. Um, in other words, um, sort of understanding the provenance of this. So this was a clip showed up on CNN. It was just COVID in Russia. Well, where in Russia? Um, no information. So we simply took a screenshot of that and then ran that a reverse Google images search across that. And we got the original broadcast, the original clip of this came from, from Yandex with a complete translation of it. And we've actually run this forward where we've actually taken an entire broadcast. Every second, every one second, extract a frame, run a global search across that, find the original source of that, and then extract out any EXFIF metadata, any captioning, any description of that, and actually make a complete chronology of a broadcast in where that material, any source material that came from. Really powerful way that we don't oftentimes think about, again, connecting modalities together, in that case, television and the web. We can also take these captioning transcripts, extract out entities from them, and look at the co-occurrences of the connections among them, and think about television as sort of this graph of things being discussed. Then we can do statistical analysis. So we can say Elon Musk, Blue Origin is most tightly connected to Elon Musk. Now that's interesting because it's not his company. Similarly, any discussion of Mars, if NASA starts talking about Mars, immediately the television news turns to Elon Musk. So again, the ability to look at these types of contextualizations and how the news tells us the stories of the world. Um, we can also go minute by minute, and we can actually say, um, oh, this is interesting. Something just uh, an abnormal, an anomaly, it's very extreme. So this was the one the Notre Dame Cathedral caught on fire. So we can see this extreme anomaly. So we can kind of see immediately when a story breaks into the news. Um, we can also do interesting things, like we can actually diagram the sentences that are spoken on television news, and we're going to actually ask questions like, did Donald Trump meet Al Gore? Yes. Um, or um, did, how does climate change contribute to Australian wildfires? This is from a while ago. And again, from that diagramming, um, be able to add, do basic question answering, simply again, looking at and treating television not as so this, this you know, video, but as, as communicating material. You can also fact check it, which is really interesting. So a lot of people have attempted, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff, Duke Reporters Labs, a lot of, have said, a lot of groups have said, well, can we actually fact check it? And of course, that's a really difficult challenge. But what you can do is say, here are known fact checks. So take, like this is the case, scan factcheck.org, take those, compute and embedding on it, and just scan television news for things that are highly similar to that. And this bot, uh, and these are very interesting because you get, for example, microchips uh, in, uh, in vials, and it knows that that's the same thing. Uh, and then things like nanochips and so on, uh, like here, the bottom example, a nanochip. So it knows a nanochip is the same as a, as, a, as a microchip. Again, that ability to do these type of really interesting semantic search or simply um, compute embeddings and actually cluster them based on this. So you can actually say, here are the, so this is a day of COVID vaccine coverage. Here are, the, here are the vaccine narratives that we know, the falsehoods that we know about. What are the ones we don't know about right now, the emergent ones? Or simply look at statistical anomalies. So this was, um, this is actually when COVID. Um, so we actually, um, the company called Blue Dot Global up in Canada, so one of the very first global alerts of COVID using our data. So this is actually us at 10 p.m. Eastern time, December uh, 30th, 2019, we detected an extreme anomaly of a SARS-like viral pneumonia of unknown origin. Now, this is when it was only in the Chinese language press. 
Now it picks up, but that's weeks later. Um, so again, that ability to look across, well, look across languages, like we're doing with Russian, Belarus, and Ukrainian television, to look beyond English. Um, and now finally, this is this is the really interesting part from an interface standpoint. So I've kind of looked at like how we've gotten where we are today and how we think about television as data. Now the future is something called the visual explorer. Um, so the idea of this really is this, is this notion that machines today, we think about using AI to understand video. AI is amazing. Um, you know, we can do things like a golden retriever detector. Uh, we can look at bookcases, mass, video, or, uh, maps on television. We can do all these amazing things. But state-of-the-art um, uh, uh, video analysis tools today typically do around 10 to 20,000 objects and activities, a fixed taxonomy. So for example, when COVID began, they all had categories for masks, but not for N95 masks because that wasn't something historically been done. Now you go and you build your class for you build a custom model for N95s. But now people come along and say, oh, but we need to differentiate KN95s from N95s. Okay, so now you build another model. And now it's question, well, actually, we want to differentiate the double, so we want to differentiate a true N95 that has a back strap versus the ear strap. Okay, now you build another model. But it's kind of this, again, it's, it's a fixed taxonomy exactly. of how you see the world. Um, and so again, like moving forward a little bit, um, one of the biggest questions that, that media scholars are interested in is less in the factual portrayals, but more in these softer things. When, a, when the president stands at the podium um, and talks about COVID, or is, is their body language conveying a strong, resolute, powerful, or more be kind of defeated and you know, just overwhelmed, or questioning and curious, um, or you know, sort of disregarding and dismissive? These are fascinating questions that machines aren't that great at. And this is where you really want to see, or the, or the imagery. So a machine can tell you certain things. They can tell you, well, the, the, they're sitting in a chair. Um, there's probably not a category for a gilded chair. Um, even then, even if there is, it's probably not going to understand, well, the flag is to the left of the person instead of to the right. And the machine doesn't understand, well, in this particular country, in this context, that is signifying something very, very important about that message. So again, they built, what we realize is we really need human beings to be able to rapidly skim television. And uh, what becomes very interesting about this is, you know, also think about things like inflation. Um, we can keyword search and tell you how much inflation is being covered right now. But what you really care about is, what are they using to illustrate it? Is it infographic? Is it a small business, electricity, a screaming baby? Is it an empty food cart? Uh, you know, how are they illustrating that? Um, so the Russian invasion really drew all these issues to the forefront because we knew, yes, we can transcribe and translate those, and we do. But what we realized is that what, what war scholars care about, what they really care about is the imagery of war. How is this being conveyed? Is it being conveyed through the eyes of military officials, uh, presidents at podiums? Is it combat imagery? And for combat imagery, is it the raw, raw tank roaring forward? Is it uh, soldiers shooting? Uh, is it, so is it heavy machinery? Is it individual soldiers? Is it an interview with a single soldier? Um, do the soldiers look exhausted? Do they look uh, you know, excited? Uh, you know, are there maps? You know, how are they portraying it? And so much of that is a soft narrative. So we realize we need to allow human beings to under to watch this. So in other words, though, but you think about television, television's video is 24 hours, endless linear format. So how do you make the linear format of television skimmable? Well, we know we want to make it in the thumbnails, uh, but how do you do that? You know, what, what does that look like? So we tested so many, and I won't go into all the details, but we tested basically essentially all of the key ways that you could take a, a television show and convert it to, to thumbnails. So some of this is representative frames. Some of this, we looked at AI tools. I could look at different things. We look at MPEG iframes and then a fixed frame rate it's every second, every two seconds. Uh, and one of the things we found is if we use AI tools to say, give me the most important moments here, one of the examples was, for example, certain U.S. politicians. Like Mar uh, one of our examples was Marjorie Taylor Greene was on Fox News, was on a Fox News clip that was then rebroadcast on uh, on Russian television. They 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 rebroadcast. In fact, Tucker Carlson's on there heavily. But one of the things that we found is the AI tool said, you know, this is a five minute clip of her um, just staring at camera talking. We're going to reduce that to one frame because nothing changes. Now that's great for certain use cases. That might be great. But for me, if I'm rapidly skimming, I'm trying to kind of understand. How much is Russian television using from outside television channels, especially from the West? Um, I see one frame and I move on. I don't realize, wow, that was five minutes of a 30 minute broadcast. That's a big deal. And so one of the things that we, so eventually what we settled on was, and there's a whole blog post about how we did this. You can see the different ways of doing it. Eventually we said every four seconds. So a television broadcast becomes every four seconds, we extract one frame, becomes this thumbnail. Um, you can click on any of these thumbnails then and play and then now a three minute clip of that. Um, and all those thumbnails. So every four seconds, we extract a frame. We call those video engrams. We actually make those available for download for at scale AI analysis. So for example, we took an entire broadcast of Anti-Fake, which is an amazing show. It's the weaponization of misinformation. 
Basically, what Russia does is it says, look, we can't be like China. We can't control our information environment. What we can do, though, is any stories out there like the Bucha massacre, they then run it head on and they say, here's a clip you may have seen from CNN. Here's why it's fake. And then they'll, you know, they'll say, oh, look, you can see that that red blood there. That's too red to be blood. That's ketchup uh, or that type of stuff. You know, so they'll actually take real clips and then pretend and then basically argue that it's fake. And then they'll show a clip maybe of Biden saying, don't believe what you see online. It's fake. Um, you know, so they take legitimate clips and use that to amplify it. So again, we can use AI to understand that. Today, our video engrams are 3 billion images towing one quadrant pixels. Um, and we can do really interesting things. So we can use those, we can do logo detection. So we can actually scan Western media being repurposed. Uh, we can do things like OCR. We can look at which direction people are facing, how many human beings are on. So we're actually doing the really interesting work in object detection. How many people are on the screen? Is it one person talking? Is it a group of people? Are they in a studio? Um, how many human faces are there? Again, are they looking at the camera? Are they looking away? Is it an interview? Um, we can do comparisons. So we can take those and you can say, um, every, you know, find, make me a thumbnail grid. So this is an example we looked at um, every every 60 seconds, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News. Here's a comparison when Donald Trump announced he was running for president. So you can see uh, Fox News immediately begins running it. Uh, MSNBC is actually still talking about some other things. Uh, CNN doesn't cut over. Now CNN cuts over briefly, cuts back. You can just kind of comparison stuff. Scale that up and you can actually see global events as they come in. You can actually see how they're being covered across the world. And what does that mean? And then finally, we're looking at some of these newer AI tools. So OpenAI also has something called Clip. So this is, so you can actually keywords as a dual embedding. You can keyword search in descriptive text. So here you type in the word nuclear and you get back nuclear imagery. You can type in drones. What's interesting with drones is you actually get someone looking at their cell phone and you say, well, how is that drone imagery? Oh, it's actually imagery they're remote controlling from their phone. But they can do more complex things. Soldier in front of a Russian flag and you actually get it. You can actually say to the right of, to the left of, et cetera. Uh, and so really, if you kind of think about this, this overarching, and I know I've covered a huge amount in a very brief period, um, but essentially, you know, my, my journey with the Internet Archive really began about a decade ago, again, starting off with these bespoke analyses where we took massive, you know, we essentially took their full archive of closed captioning transcripts for CNN, NBC, Fox, BBC, and, and onward, and then basically took those, ran them on big computing power, ran all these heavy analyses, um, and then outputted a single visualization. Then moving forward, doing more sophisticated analysis from geocoding to more sophisticated things that actually use some of the AV. So instead of just the, the textual captioning, using some of the AV signals. Uh, so in that case, fingerprinting. And then kind of looking again at, at interface. How, how do we visualize this? How do we visualize a map? Uh, what are the different ways? So an animated map, do we do raindrops? Like what, what does it look like? How best communicates that to scholars, but then also the general public? Um, and then and then stepping forward, this, this, the state of the unit addresses were really interesting because no one had done that before. And so what does that interface look like? So again, showing like the, so in our case, we chose showing the transcript line by line. Then you could see, you could actually click on it, see kind of a timeline of the hours later where broadcast across the world, click, um, see the different geographies, the different clips. Um, so again, what does that look like? And then moving forward a little bit to n-gram, so keyword search, and then eventually to freeform keyword search, and then the OCR search. And OCR search was interesting because we had to then teach journalists, like, what, is it, what does it mean to search the, the on-screen text? Because if you're not familiar with, if you don't study television news, you don't realize what, what is a Chiron? Um, it's not, you know, it's something different. It doesn't exist anywhere else uh, because it's sort of an editorialized summary. So there might, they might like CNN and MSNBC and Fox might show the same, uh, maybe they'll show a Fauci briefing. So CNN will say, Dr. Fauci uh, discusses COVID. MSNBC might say, uh, Fauci uh, slams down the Republican critics. And then Fox News might say, Fauci the liar lies once again. Um, and so those are things that don't exist anymore. That's not in the spoken. The spoken transcript just is what he's saying. And so this editorialization, so again, now so that involves not just an interface, but actually teaching people how to think about it. And then with, um, and then when we added visual search, you can actually keyword search for these objects and activities. That is supposed to be a very unique challenge because people aren't used to thinking about visual, quantified visual search, where I have to sort of discretize my search into these predefined categories. We don't do, I mean, categorical search is not something that other than information experts that are trained on that, um, using things like dialogue, et cetera. These are not things that ordinary people think about. They think about in terms of keywords. Um, and then fast forward all the way to some of these AI tools where the limitations, the strengths, what does it look like to do visual search where I can type like this? Um, and then again, making those engrams. So you know, what does an interface look like? So we actually, the Visual Explorer um, was, uh, and, and it was very interesting. It is both an interface. So at the first part, it's a methodological question of how do you make television accessible to journalists and scholars for, for rigorous study? Then it comes to how do you make it skimmable? So the first realization is it needs to be skimmable. So how do you make television skimmable? So the idea of thumbnails, 
Then you have another, and these are not technical questions. There's a methodological question. Well, what thumbnail? So in that case, what we did is we said, here are questions. Skim this, tell it. So literally what we did is we actually had to go through this exercise. Count up uh, how much of this broadcast was Putin? How much of this broadcast is Western media? How often does this occur? So specific questions, and then trying to answer those questions using, using interfaces built around each of those different thumbnailing approaches, and then finding out which works. So then eventually settling on that four seconds. Now, what's the technological infrastructure that allows it to happen? Now you have to scale that up. Gee, we've got, uh, you know, in this case, 100 plus channels, 60 or 70 channels live. Um, how do you actually do that? And this is all HD content. How do you make that tractable? How do you do that? And then eventually delivering that. Um, and so thank you so much. I know I've covered a huge amount of ground really, really rapidly. Uh, but uh, hopefully this was uh, hopefully this was very interesting to you. Thank you very much, Khalif. As per usual, this was a tour de force. I really enjoyed what you were showing us today. Um, there are some questions here in the chat. And of course, everybody, feel free to ask your questions as well. Um, so a lot of the work that you do seems to be relevant for a variety of stakeholders. But first and foremost, I could see that being really valuable for journalists that report about other media outlets or about the media landscape in general. So um, how can journalists and others that rely on your type of analysis make use of your work? Yeah, so we actually have so the, so we have something called the Television Explorer, um, so that you can keyword search the closed captioning. Uh, and so actually we have, a, um, a, I was going to put in the chat, I don't think I have it in front of me. We actually have a blog post that rounds up uh, kind of all of our, uh, all of our different data sets uh, and tools. So one of them is the Television Explorer, simple keyword search of the closed captioning. Uh, so that's Television Explorer. So you can easily keyword search. Um, again, it doesn't do stemming. So the difference between economic and economy, you have to type those in separately. And there's a reason for that because oftentimes tense matters. Uh, and so the ability to do that. So that one, you can say borders versus Im immigrants. So that gives you, oh, certain can talk about, uh, we're actually in the past, we talked about physical barriers versus human live human beings. So those kind of, those different kinds of interesting uh, patterns of language. So that when you keyword search, that's used by journalists all the time. Uh, uh, Philip Bump at the Washington Post uses it regularly. 538's done a bunch of pieces. A lot of, that's kind of the default that a lot of journalists use. We also have the TV AI Explorer, same idea. Keyword search, kind of the on-screen text. Now the Visual Explorer, uh, which uh, is, uh, is our kind of our latest, um, that allows you to do all kinds of, that's kind of the skimmable interface essentially, where you can do all kinds of very interesting uh, different uh, types of analysis. And I'll see if I can find it really quickly, the, uh, the, blog, put the link, blog post to put in here. I put a link to the API for the Television Explorer into the chat here. Let me see if I can I, find I, the, uh, the, the thing really fast. Uh, here we go. This is the, uh, so this gives you kind of all the links at once. Uh, this blog post gives you both the explorers, but then all of our different data sets that we have uh, that go with that. Um, and yes, I'm definitely going to submit for the client project. So I think there'll be a lot of interest there. Um, and yeah, so it's it's really, it, it gets a lot of use in journalists. We're seeing a lot of use, uh, uh, growing use in, uh, you know, for example, governments trying to understand narratives across the world. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest in using it for Ukraine um, to be able to understand the narrative. So you can actually do very interesting things. And we we will have full text search, actually, of those translated tra uh, things coming very soon to so actually be able to full text search uh, Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian television and be able to look at these different narratives. How are they ebbing and flowing uh, there? And we are looking at at scale visual search as well of that. And yes, as I see a question about YouTube videos. Um, so yes, so we are working right now on the ability so that um, basically any video that has been archived by the internet archive um, into its uh, holdings. And a lot of times these may, be, these may have started life as YouTube videos. We are working on an interface to that. So for example, uh, one of the starting points, January 6th committee, um, you know, their, their broadcasts were, were aired on C-SPAN. So that's already in uh, the Television Explorer, or sorry, the Visual Explorer. Um, and, the, and the Television Explorer, uh, but there were all these sort of side peripheral videos that they also uploaded to YouTube. Those were mirrored into the Internet Archive. So now we're going to actually debut with those and actually show how the Visual Explorer looks uh, with this. So yes, we are working on that exact ability. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you for uh, getting the questions out of the chat. We are out of time. Kalef, thank you so much. We are very looking forward to having you as a client again. Uh, you had two project teams, I think, last year that worked with you. So your projects are very popular. Um, wonderful. So with that, thank you everybody for coming to today's CNS Visual Showcase. Kalef, thank you so much for coming in. And, uh, thank you so much talk, for having uh, me. Yeah, talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.